Well, welcome everybody to the Wednesday weekly webinar. Um, today's speaker is going to be Clifford Hall with NDSU Plant Sciences. Um, but first off, I'm going to go through a few reminders that Julie has asked me to do. We got, of course, we'll have two more after, uh, or three more after today. Next week will be Julie, and then one more on April 20th, and then on the 27th we got today's speaker Cliff Hall and, and Julie again. We'll be uh, uh, dual presenting on our final one April 27th. So. Also a reminder that we're archiving all these to YouTube. You can find those archives on the Field to Fork website, or if you just went to YouTube and searched uh, NDSU Extension, you can find all our videos listed there and, and find the Field to Fork ones um, listed there as well. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and type them down there in the chat area, which is number five here on the screen, the lower left-hand corner. Um, you just type in that big open uh, white rectangular box and hit enter and uh, Cliff will see the questions that pop up and hopefully he'll catch a few during the session if you have one uh, that you want him to answer while he's speaking and then of course at the end uh, will be a good time to throw a bunch more questions at him and see if we can keep him for a couple extra hours. <laughs> and finally, the, uh, Julie always wants to have you do the survey. Please fill up the survey at the end of the webinar. Um, I believe she said you guys get an email sent to you uh, but I'll also throw that down in the chat area so you can click on it when, when it's over. Um, for those that need to get a, some continuing ed credit, the, she said after the survey you do get a, um, you get sent to a, a site where you can print off a certificate, I believe. And she's also choosing random people to give prizes to for those that fill up the survey. So definitely some reasons to do that survey afterwards. All right, on to today's topic. It's uh, farm to market, safe food handling during processing and selling local foods, and as I said, our speaker is Clifford Hall. Um, Dr. Hall is currently a professor in the Cereal and Food Sciences programs in the Plant Sciences Department at North Dakota State University. He oversees research on pulse quality and utilization of pulses in food systems and oversees the annual U.S. Pulse Quality Survey. He has taught 80 courses at NDSU since 2006 and has advised 11 Ph.D. students and 12 master's students. He has also mentored over 30 undergraduate researchers and has served on over 30 graduate student committees. His primary research areas include the utilization of non-traditional crops in food products. And so now time to pass over to Dr. Hall. Go ahead. All right. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's a privilege to be able to uh, present this topic area. Uh, Julie and I have worked for many years um, kind of at this food safety level, at the, the food processing level. Um, since that's my expertise area, um, I feel feel comfortable talking with that. So when she asked me to do it, I said I would help her out. So uh, keep in mind that with some of the information I provide today, I will direct your attention to some of the uh, information provided at the uh, North Dakota Department of Health. Uh, so that will be a resource that you can direct anybody asking questions to. Um, also, um, in a few weeks, I will, along with Julie, be uh, discussing more uh, information about kind of the processing aspects of, of that food system. So with today's uh, presentation, I will just cover some, some basics of processed foods and, and its relationship to pH. I will just quickly go through some general North Dakota rules for selling and labeling products. And then I will um, address any questions that you might have. So those are some things that uh, we will do today. Uh, the first thing to remember is that when we talk about food preservation, we also talk about this concept of pH. Um, pH is very important because the, the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, uh, defines foods uh, based on a, a pH, essentially. Um, for example, the FDA will identify products as an acid food, a low acid food, and then one that would be classified as an acidified food. The first two, the, the acid and the low acid, those are inherent to the 
the food product. So if you have a, uh, an orange, for example, an orange is acid in nature. So the pH, you squeeze out that juice from the orange, do the pH, it's going to be acid in nature. A low acid food is one that uh, you would see has very low acidity to it. So it's going to have a much higher, higher pH. Um, acidified food um, is one then that is oftentimes a low acid food that we've added an acid to, to make it considered acidified. So those are some FDA definitions for, for different food categories based on pH. Keep in mind that we measure pH based on the uh, pH scale. So it's, it's a, something that you need to have a pH meter as, essentially to, to measure that. So let's just highlight some of the foods that would be in these different categories. We have low acid foods. Uh, these products have pH values above 4.6. And remember on an acidity scale, 7 is considered neutral, 14 is considered very alkaline in nature, and 1 is very acidic. So it's a case where just recognizing that when we talk about low acid and high acid foods, keep in mind is the kind of the reverse in terms of numbers. So in a low acid food, those are products that have higher pHs. So anything above 4.6 is considered a low acid food. An acid food is one that has a pH of 4.6 or lower. So, so you again have a, a definition here where specifically you have a pH of 4.6. So always remember that number. Uh, so if someone calls you up and says, well, my food was uh, measured at a pH of 4.3, you can t tell them that, well, that was an acid food because that's lower than the 4.6. So that's, uh, again, a way to think about this pH scale. Acidified foods are oftentimes low acid foods that have, been, that have had acid added to them. Um, and one of the important parts of this, an acidified food, is that it must have an equilibrium pH of 4.6 or lower. So you have to add sufficient acid to make that low acid food item into that, that essentially that acid pH range. So that's essentially, again, what we would see with regards to the, the pH scale. So if we just summarize some of the foods that might be in these categories. Uh, your acid foods, these would be, of course, fruit, uh, pickles, sauerkraut. And then tomatoes and figs are, are sometimes right at that cutoff of 4.6. And so it's always important to understand what uh, tomato product that you, you are using and do your garden tomatoes have the correct uh, pH? Because we find that, that some tomatoes grown in very alkaline uh, conditions or alkaline soils actually can have a pH above 4.6. So it's very important to understand that even though we put tomatoes and figs in this acid foods category, they do need to have added lemon juice citric acid or vinegar, depending on your formulation. But low, low acid foods, in contrast to that, would be meat, they would be seafood, uh, poultry, milk, and, and really all fresh vegetables, with the exception of maybe uh, tomatoes. So again, just recognizing the difference between acid and, and low acid foods, very, very important. So the question becomes, which of the following will not help to make a food product more acidic? So if you want to take just uh, 10 seconds here and, and write down a, a, an answer or response, uh, feel free to do that in the chat. And in just a few seconds, I'll highlight the answer for you. So again, which of the following will not help to make a food product more acidic? OK, so a number of you said, uh, had indicated water, and that is correct. Uh, keep in mind that in order to make a f uh, maybe one of these low acid foods acidic, you have to have something that has a pH that will lower the pH of that food. And, and water is neutral, right around that pH of 7. So therefore, it will never um, make a, a, a 
low acid food acidic. So again, recommendations, citric acid, vinegar, lemon juice are the common ones that we would use. So as you can see here, water was that, that selection. So again, uh, remember this, this value of 4.6 is important. Um, and if asked, tomatoes or figs, uh, recommend citric acid or lemon juice. Those are the ones that, that we oftentimes will recommend, at least Julie and I do, um, citric acid and lemon juice uh, for acidifying those low acid foods. One of the uh, important aspects of preservation is a concept known as pickling. And, and we just generically oftentimes refer to things as, as pickles, um, but recognizing that with pickles, you can have a pickled cucumber, you can have pickled green beans. So anything that you have an acid added to is, is we generically refer to that as a pickled product. But, but keep in mind that it's really defined as an acidified product. So again, you'll see uh, very common that vinegar is one of those ingredients on pickles or um, uh, pickled green beans, etc. Another very important um, recommendation that we uh, always make to individuals learning to, to can um, or maybe those that have been canning for many years, uh, we always ask them to uh, really look at the USDA guidelines for canning um, acidified and acid, uh, acid types of foods. Uh, it's important that they follow tested recipes or formulations. Um, I've, I've seen a number of individuals try to contact me to do a pH on products. And then when you, you measure that pH and you find, well, it's a pH of, of five, and you start asking questions about how they can the products, you know, they, they are clearly not doing it correctly. So it's important that, that if you have an individual that comes to you asking about canning, direct them to the USDA guidelines for formulations and, and some of the conditions for processing uh, products. Two approved methods of canning products at home in this USDA uh, guidelines include boiling water bath canning and then uh, pressure canning. Uh, with boiling water bath, it's important to understand that the, the temperature, the maximum temperature you can achieve is 212 degrees Fahrenheit and that's at sea level. And, and I don't immediately have numbers offhand for different sea levels, but at, at at uh, sea level, it is 212 Fahrenheit. In this particular case, uh, recognizing that that is the maximum temperature any food will will achieve um, when when canning at sea level. So the use of of acid um, for using this particular technique, then you can use acid foods or acidified foods. So those are really the only two categories of foods that we can process with the boiling water bath canning method. In contrast to that, we have pressure canning. And with pressure canning, um, you achieve temperatures that are much higher. 240 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperatures that we can achieve. And just recognizing that in pressure canning, the pressure is what allows for the temperature to, to get to 240 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's why we, we do that. Boiling water bath canner will never get that high. Now, 212 is the maximum. Pressure canning at least 240. Keep in mind that with pressure canning, you can achieve temperature, uh, temperatures of 250 degrees Fahrenheit depending on what pressure is in that, that canner. Um, and remember that, that with low acid foods, the pressure canning is really the only method that we can used to, to not 100% guarantee you're going to kill everything, but at least you, you get a better confidence that you've eliminated a lot of the organisms of concern. With pressure canning, we also have mixtures of, of acid and low acid food items. 
So if you feel like your, your product is not at that pH of 4.6 or lower, um, pressure canning is, is the way to go in that scenario. One of the most important things to remember, though, is that with low um, acid foods, they cannot be sold in the public, all right? So uh, these are products that you cannot sell. So if you can just green beans or carrots or a mixture of carrots and onions, these are considered the low acid foods, and therefore you cannot sell those to the public, okay? Uh, so in this scenario, as we're, we're speaking in the context of, of the presentation here, um, people that can at home cannot sell to the, the public. The, these low acid foods. Oops. So if you know, where do we start then? It's like I want to know, you know, what are my uh, pHs of my food products that I will be actually evaluating? And uh, it's important then to uh, talk to to any individual that has questions or concerns about pH um, and recognizing that there's an array of of ways in which we can measure pH. Uh, in, in elementary school and, and junior high school, you may have played around with litmus paper and you may have tested the acidity of, of a fruit juice or baking soda solution or something and you saw the, the, the litmus paper change to a blue or a pink color. Um, those particular types of, of uh, pH measurements are fine if you're playing around in a lab and doing little tests but it's not appropriate for food items because you just don't know what the specific value is. You just know that it changed colors. There's also been uh, a lot of products being sold on the market that are for swimming pools and testing swimming pool water uh, where they have a series of pHs and they have these different uh, color codes that allow you to differentiate a pH of three versus four. Uh, so you can see that over here, you see the lab supplies product it allows you to at least define what's three and four is, but again, it does not allow you to specifically say that the pH of this product is 4.6 or less. It just says that it's three or four. So again, this type of product is not suitable for measuring pH of food products. That gets us into then more of the pH meters. We have handheld meters. So you can see here we have the two handheld meters. Uh, depending on the, on the pH meter, you want to make sure that you continually uh, assess whether or not they are recording accurately. So you would have calibrations, and I'll talk about that shortly. Um, usually the handheld meters um, have relatively good uh, precision and accuracy and repeatability. However, if you want one that um, has, has, over the long run, has more consistency in terms of of repeatability, precision, etc. Those would be the more expensive meters that you're getting into. That would be a lab or a bench top type of meter, or uh, a handheld unit that that is very similar to that uh, bench top model. So when we want to identify then the the pH of a product, uh, you need to look at your your ingredients that you're selecting. Uh, when we highlight garlic, for example, or cucumbers or onions, these particular products, if you grind these up with a little bit of distilled water and then take the, the pH of that product, you'll end up with a product that's in that low acid category. So in this particular scenario, just recognizing that, that you need to understand what is the pH of your product because if your pH is on that low acid category, no matter what method you, you use, you always have to consider that it will be a low acid food until you add acid to it. So if, if it's a, a cucumber product, you want to make pickles, you're adding vinegar to that formulation. Um, and then in the corner here, I have a tomato and has that question mark, and I've already brought this up a little bit earlier in that with tomatoes, depending on the growing environment, some are at that, that pH 4.6 .6 or lower, while others are just maybe 4.7. So there are some, some differences in pH, and so get to know what your tomatoes uh, would be. 
If you take a look at the University of Georgia and the, the uh, collaboration with the FDA, they, this particular link that I provide for you has um, the, a listing of all these different food items and, and what the pH is. So it's, it, it's a, a good way to get started with identifying pHs of these different foods. And then, of course, every time you want to uh, run a, a calibration on that pH meter, because from day to day, the pH meter can function differently based on temperature, uh, based on humidity in the air. So it's important that every day that you are carrying a product that you undergo a calibration before you start measuring pH on different products. And, and we're not going to watch the video. There is a video out there that you can see. Um, if you have trouble seeing it, um, just let Julie or I know and we can uh, figure out a way to, to have you watch that. But again, make sure that you recognize that the recommendation is, is to do a, a, a calibration on that, that uh, pH meter. So once you've identified the food and the food ingredients, the pHs of those products, and then calibrate the machine, you can then move forward and, and measure the pH of that product. And, and generally speaking, the way that we do this in the lab is that we, we take a given amount of product and we grind it in a, in a, a blender, and then we measure the pH. And products that do not have sufficient liquid, we oftentimes will will uh, mix with distilled water and then record the pH. Um, the FDA also has an official method where you, you separate the, the components of that system. So if you have pickles and the, 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 the vinegar, the brine solution, you separate those two components and then you add them back in the appropriate ratio that's in that product and you grind that and then you measure pH. So it's important to understand that with this pH, um, you will have to have some liquid in that. So if you don't have enough liquid, it's, it's pretty tough to actually measure then uh, pH value. So then you have some questions. You know, once I've, I've calibrated that pH, um, what's next? And, and so you've measured that pH. And you, you have to identify, is it 4.6 or less? If the answer is yes, this is considered an acid food. If you say no, the pH was 5.1, then this is considered um, to be then that low acid food. So again, 4.6 is that magic number to remember. In terms of processing then, uh, if we said yes, our, our product was 4.1, that's considered an acid food, and so then we can use a boiling water bath. So that's, that's the important thing to remember is that this pH allows us to establish can we use a boiling water bath or do we need to use that a pressure canner. And in this particular case, if it's, if it's considered then a low acid food, um, you have to use that, that pressure canner, okay? However, if you have a low acid food that you add acid to, so I'm going to add vinegar, or I'm going to add citric acid to that food product, I've now acidified that product, so that becomes then this acidified food item, and then you can, again, use a boiling water bath. So remember from the previous slide, that was when you had a pH of 4.6 or less, that was considered an acid food, you can use a boiling water bath. On the opposite side, you had the low acid food. If I add acid to that, it becomes a, what we define as that acidified food. You can use the boiling water bath. However, if you are not adding acid to this low acid food, then you have to use that pressure canner. So those, again, just kind of use this flow chart as a way to establish uh, what type of method I need to use when it comes to uh, processing. So I want to shift gears a little bit away from this general concept of pH and move into more of this uh, fact sheet that is available by the uh, North Dakota Department of Health. Um, again, this is uh, the, the food and, and lodging division. Uh, 
in the next few slides, we'll go over this in, in more detail, but I believe that, that this particular fact sheet, um, maybe Julia sent out prior to, to this presentation. She definitely has it listed and linked to uh, the North Dakota Department of Health. So if you, you need to pull up something, uh, just take a look at the, the full document. Uh, what I do here in the next few slides, and it's kind of pull apart this document just to see kind of how it fits into our discussion on pH. So the first thing again, remember, is that when we do home processing, um, we have to make sure we understand what products are allowable for us to sell at, say, farmers markets and what products are not. And uh, one quick thing to remember again is this concept of pH. When we have products such as pickles and we have vegetables or fruits that have an equilibrium pH value of 4.6 or lower, we can sell products uh, to that farmer's market. If we have non-temperature controlled baked goods that do not require refrigeration, these products can also be sold. So again, it's a case where uh, the key in, in that second type of food product is that it does not require refrigeration. So if something requires refrigeration, then you cannot sell it. Um, if it's going to be a canned product you're selling, remember again, this pH of 4.6 or lower is that key number. Um, also then, when you, you are selling or want to sell these products, the question is, is where can I sell these uh, to consumers? And uh, one, this particular list shows you different things. So we can sell the products at county fairs, at nonprofit charitable events, we can also um, sell them at uh, community celebrations, uh, farmers markets, and then roadside stands. So these are the places that we can we can sell uh, these different uh, uh, products to, or in the location that we can sell these. So again, remember they may ha must meet that pH of 4.6 or lower criteria or be non-refrigerated baked items. So those are the requirements still and, and they're available at, for sale at these different locations. Um, and again, I think my, my marker went quickly to this one. Uh, again, which of the following is an acceptable place for selling food products? Uh, keep in mind that the farmer's market is uh, on this list is, is the only place that you can actually sell these products. Once you start selling products on the internet, at craft shows, and in other states, um, it becomes a, a case of, of um, products that, that um, actually fall under the, the FDA jurisdictions in the case of the internet in other states. And, and maybe in a few weeks you'll, we'll touch on this a little bit more. Um, I do see one question about jams and jellies. And jams and jellies basically would be an acidified food product. Um, so uh, they fall under the, the product that you can sell just because, again, they're acid in nature. Um, and, and so they would be allowable for sale. So again, just recognizing, going back to this slide, um, we want to make sure that you just recognize that if people ask you, well, can I sell it on the internet, make sure you just tell them that you can't just because you, you're, you don't know if you're going to have someone in Minnesota buying it or North Carolina or Florida that might be buying it. Um, with regards to, to pepper jams, I see another question about pepper jams and jellies. Again, the, the question here is, is what is that equilibrium pH? If that equilibrium pH is 4.6 or less, then, then that would be an acceptable product. Just be, again, it, it's, it's that pH is really what the defining um, determination is. So in this particular case, as long as it has a pH of less than 4.6, you'd be okay with, with pepper jams and jellies. What's also important to, if you want to sell uh, 
products and uh, the, the individual has to post some signage. And the signage here relates to the fact that these uh, can products uh, or baked goods that they are homemade, so you're highlighting that they are ho ho uh, homemade, and also that they are not subject to state inspection. And that these food products have been produced in a domestic kitchen and ha have not been produced under inspection. So you have to post this to let people know that it hasn't gone through the same type of process as food that might be sold at a grocery so store. Um, so it's, it's again important that they uh, recognize that. So the consumer then can, would have some responsibility in this and knowing that, okay, it, it wasn't prepared and inspected uh, kitchen basically. So what are some of the labeling requirements that we would have on a product? Um, keep in mind that, that labeling requirements um, are slightly different than what you would see at a national level. So again, when you talk about the FDA, their requirements are different than, say, these local foods and local produce and local product types of labeling. Uh, so if you want to sell then a product at the, the farmer's market, you have to, again, give a product name. You have to uh, provide information about the name of the producer and contact information. So um, if someone gets ill from consuming your product, at least they can contact you or the health department could contact that individual. So it's, it's a, again, important to have the name of that, that producer on that, that product. What's also important is that the date the product was made or canned. If you go to the grocery store, you see a lot of dates, say, used by or expiration date. Um, keep in mind those are used by dates. Um, in this particular case, we're specifically saying that you would give the date that that product was actually made. So that's a difference uh, because um, with the, the large food manufacturers, they're worried more about quality issues, and so they say, well, use it by a certain date. In, in this particular case, the date the product was made should be, it needs to be on that label. And also then you have ingredients. So the ingredient label um, must be on there because if you have a, an allergen to some sort of food ingredient, uh, it really needs to be uh, listed so people are aware that, hey, this contains uh, maybe uh, walnut or something else if it's a baked good. Uh, that way they know that, okay, you have wal walnut in that product. Also, I don't have listed up here for label requirements, but you can see this on the fact sheet. So if you have your fact sheet available, you can, you can look at that. But one of the other things that's an important label requirement is that there's a statement where um, that they should have listed on that product that the product was uh, produced in an uninspected home kitchen where major food allergens may also have been handled and prepared, such as tree nuts, peanuts, egg, soy, milk, etc. So there is also a labeling requirement for them to put that on that product. So again, take a look at the fact sheet. It has, has more information that you can, you can see. Um, then the next question always is with regards to a nutrition facts label. And remember, the nutrition facts label is, is that nutrition facts panel um, that you would, you would include. Um, this particular one, you can see there's an ingredient label, but the nutrition facts panel would be what I've highlighted here. Um, and the, the answer to that is no. It's not required for small businesses. However, if you want one or the, a client want one, wants one for their product, they can always contact Julie. She can, she can do labels for them. Uh, again, these are not, not required for small businesses. Um, however, keep in mind uh, that if you plan to sell um, across the borders, you have to be 
aware of, of other regulatory issues. And so again, we'll try to cover this in a, in a couple of weeks on, on another webinar. So again, uh, just recognizing with the Nutrition Facts panel, the, the, if you're going to sell at the local for, farmer's market, there's no need to put, or there's not a need to put that on there. However, you can if you wish. So again, what are some of the products that you may may not sell? So in this case, we're, we can't sell these items. Uh, home canned products, low acid foods such as peas, beets, green beans, carrots. These are all considered uh, low acid, so that's out of the question. Uh, you cannot sell fresh salsas and pestos uh, that require refrigeration. So if you're prepared a fresh salsa or a, a pesto, um, these are also not allowed to be sold because they do require refrigeration. So anything that requires refrigeration um, cannot be cannot be sold. Uh, also, any product dealing with with canned fish, pickled eggs, or meat. Uh, cannot be sold. Of course, with some of these products, keep in mind they might be under, might be in the acid pH range, such as a pickled egg, but it's still not allowed to be sold. So again, if somebody asks you that, just recognizing that that's, there's a few exceptions to this acidified food, um, acidified food uh, terminology that we've been using. So any non-acid food processed by boiling water bath or a home a pressure cooker or canner, again, these are not, not allowable. So under the regulatory jurisdiction then, um, again, just recognizing with the, the health department, uh, the USDA requirements, uh, you're not allowed to sell, again, fish, dairy, poultry, and meat products. Uh, some of the examples that would be in these particular categories would be things such as smoked fish, uh, butter, raw milk, uh, jerky, and then uh, potentially hazardous products such as garlic and oil mixtures or flavored oils. Okay, so these are products that are considered to be under different juris regulatory jurisdictions and therefore um, would not be, uh, you could not sell these types of products at this farmer's market. So which food product cannot be sold in North Dakota? Um, so I'll give you just a, a second or two to figure out what uh, the answer is. So again, we're, we're indicating cannot be sold in North Dakota. So if you want to put down, so I see D. So in this particular case, uh, D is that answer. Uh, so always remember that if you have a canned artichoke that has a pH of, of 4.9, that, that is definitely not a requirement for of 4.6. So again, not allowed to sell. Custards, again, that requires a temperature. So uh, refrigeration is needed for a custard type product. And then salsa, as we indicated earlier, you know, cannot be sold. So again, it's it's important to, to recognize. Um, sometimes people um, think, well, because so and so did this for 20 years, it should be safe. Uh, isn't necessarily always uh, a good rule to follow. So again, uh, remember then, uh, food products that you can sell uh, would be. Anything that has a pH of 4.6 or less. Uh, so you would have, uh, again, pickles, tomatoes, salsa, um, apples, cherries, grapes, etc. So you would have a number of, of, of products that you could sell. One thing that I do want to highlight to you that we really haven't covered much is that of the natural, naturally fermented um, foods such as sauerkraut. Um, in natural fermentation, oftentimes what happens is there's a development of acid by the, the microorganisms. And so that, that fermented product then, such as sauerkraut, becomes acid in nature. And so then it, it's considered then in that category of an acid food because it's naturally during that fermentation process, 
it had a pH that dropped below 4.6. So again, that is that is the important criteria always to remember is that pH of 4.6. Uh, some home baked, we haven't really covered the baking process extensively, but in this particular case, products that are allowed would be things like lefsa, bread and rolls, fruit pies, uh, candies and confections, and, and sugar, or cookies and, and bars. And, and one of the things to remember with some of these products, um, they're high in sugar and low in, and, and low in water, and so that's why they, they're safer than some of the other uh, products that are not allowed, which would be custards, um, custard-filled pa uh, pastries, meringues, cream pies, including pumpkin pie and, and kuchen. So these are um, are products that, that um, would not be allowed for sale. And we have a question about um, sour cream bars or lemon bars, and, and I would uh, probably hesitate to recommend um, the the lemon bars, given the ones that I've had. Uh, but I would have to actually probably uh, maybe ask Julie about that, or we can always talk to the North Dakota Department of Health. So that would be one that I'm not quite certain on. But uh, knowing how the lemon bars, at least the ones that I've had, um, I would I would say they maybe not be allowed, but Again, I would defer that, that question to the, the health department. So then another little quiz question for you is, is what food products can I sell at North Dakota? So if you want to just quickly think of an answer. So it looks like a number of you have picked D, and, and so that's good to hear, and that would be true. So dill pickle, sauerkraut, bread, they all meet that, that requirement of, of the um, Department of, of Health. So then the, the question here is kind of shifting gears again away from now kind of the consumer end and, and talk about why all the concern. You, know, you, you keep telling me about pH and you tell me what foods I can and cannot sell, but why why? Um, all the concern about these particular products. And uh, if, I think because, you know, as time goes on, we, we don't, we, we kind of forget history. And, and uh, this is a good example of, of history in that, uh, you know, 12 dine with death in Grafton Farm Home. So it's a case where, where a number of people uh, died from consuming uh, basically improperly uh, processed food items. And I believe this was uh, peas, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in this particular case, uh, again, the, the poison that they ingested um, is one that we have a great concern about, and we'll talk about that coming up in the next few slides. Uh, and then another, you know, it's not just an incident of, of one case. There's a number of cases like this. Um, and and see with with regards to um, with regards to uh, other uh, other um, individuals. Again, it was was based on on uh, some sort of salad. So they canned the product and then they made a salad out of it, and that is what what basically um, oftentimes is, is a cause of some of these deaths uh, and not so much that they reheated the product prior to consumption. So it's, it, they use that in, in a salad of some sort. Um, I have a couple of questions that I kind of missed a few minutes ago. Uh, one of the questions is, does sauerkraut need to be canned or does the fermentation itself sufficient? And the the question, the answer there is that it should be canned. So as soon as it's the fermentation is done, you would can it, and then you would you would treat it in a boiling water bath. Um, in that particular case, then it becomes shelf stable. Uh, there are products on the market that are fresh uh, sauerkraut products, but those are in the refrigerated case. So keep in mind that that. Um, 
because it would be in a refrigerated case or have a requirement of refrigeration, you would not be able to sell it because it has that temperature requirement. Uh, so I always recommend that that sauerkraut be, be uh, canned and you can use a boiling water bath to do that because you're uh, in an acid environment. Um, the second, second question is, is if uh, custard based, I would assume there would be a requirement for refrigeration, therefore would not be allowed. So that must be um, going back to our lemon, our lemon bar question and maybe sour cream. So that would be, again, if you, refrigeration is required for, for any uh, baked item, keep in mind that that would then not be allowed just because if, you, if it's, uh, has that requirement of refrigeration. Um, so again, going back to our, our concerns with, with people dying from consuming these different products, uh, what we find here is that Clostridium botulinum is that product that we're most concerned with. With Clostridium botulinum, keep in mind that, that um, it's actually the toxin that is produced from Clostridium botulinum that, that causes the problem. The live organism really isn't the problem, it's the toxin that it, it produces. However, if the, live, if the live organism is there in that product, chances are you have toxin. So you have to be careful uh, just in recognizing that the toxin is really what the problem is. Uh, another important problem with regards to uh, the Clostridium botulinum is that it produces spores. So there's spores. This organism produces spores, and that these spores actually need a little bit of heat to actually promote their, for them to germinate and grow. Uh, so, so if you have a boiling water bath, for example, these spores basically are triggered to germinate. And so when, when your, your product is sitting in that jar, these spores start to germinate, the organisms start to grow, and it starts to produce toxin. And, and that's basically how that toxin ends up in, in uh, these low acid foods is because uh, those spores were, were triggered to start growing and start producing these. And, and keep in mind, Clostridium botulinum grows best in a, a low oxygen atmosphere, so a, a canned product really is a billing or is a, the ideal environment for Clostridium botulinum. So just remember that at 212, that's not sufficient to destroy the microorganism or affect the, the spore, kill the spore. It affects it because it allows it to help germinate. Um, so you need to have the high pressure to help inactivate that, that spore. Um, also, the proper acidification and pH is important because that's also what limits the growth. Uh, so these are products that that um, uh, would, would um, the, the Clostridium does not grow well in, in, in acid environments. So that's another way to, to, to prevent Clostridium from, from growing. And that's why we have this differentiation of acid food or acidified food versus low acid. And, and it's because we know that Clostridium botulinum does not grow in acid environments. Um, what are some foods that are linked to botulism? So there's been a, a number of, of, of cases, so not just the ones that I've showed, uh, but a lot of camp products like corn and, and green beans, peas, uh, tuna fish, chicken, liver pate, so all of these products, there's a potential for botulism. So anything that has low acid condi conditions and they're packed under kind of low oxygen atmosphere. Lunch meats, ham, sausage, these are also products that, that um, botulism has been associated with. And then also we have uh, honey. So infants in particular um, are, are susceptible to infant botulism when, when fed honey. So that's why honey is not something that you would want to feed an infant. So let's move on and just kind of wrap up in the next few uh, slides. Um, just some general things about registration and, and fees. Um, if, if a client comes to you and asks about registering their business, uh, 
there is a $25 fee for that, but it's for five years. So once you register your, your, your business name, it's good for five years, and then you can renew after that. Uh, obtain a sales tax permit, so you have to get on and, and identify the sales tax uh, permit. That is free, so you don't have to pay anything for that. You, they just want to have you uh, basically uh, see how much you make, because if you make enough, you, you might be subjected to taxes. But again, it's it's sales tax permit. It, it's free to get that permit. And then rental space. So that's going to vary from one market to another. So just be aware that that's going to be another thing that they need to consider is if they want to, to sell at a farmer's market. If they want to sell at a roadside stand, then, then they have requirements of purchasing a stand and so forth. So again, uh, Rental space is, is very much dependent on where that is. So which of the following is not required by law if you occasionally sell items at a farmer's market? So which of these is not required? So in this particular case, a business license uh, is not required. So, so a business license is really not required at, at this time if it's just an occasional thing. Uh, but again, you have to have that sales permit. You, should, you have that $5 or $25 for five year requirement for business registration. And then of course, if you are renting the space at the farmer's market, you have that, that fee. Um, so with that, that pretty much wraps up a lot of my discussion. I just want to highlight a few things Julie requested that I present to you. Again, just draw your attention to the Agricultural and University Extension, uh, you know, choose your crop, apples, chickpea, et cetera. These are kind of in that, that specialty crops area. So again, it it's, has some very good uh, information and worthwhile information for you to, to check out. Um, also, there's a food entrepreneur and, and resource guide for the food industry. So if you're, you're interested in, in if you're interested or, or you have a, an individual that's interested, this is really a good site to get started with. Um, and um, essentially then uh, it helps you think of it in the context of a, being an entrepreneur. And then here's a local foods uh, website that you can check out to, to get a sense of, of local foods. Um, and then just a reminder, I want to thank you for attending this this uh, presentation. Uh, don't forget to fill out this, the the survey. It looks like Scott has posted it in in the chat area. Um, and then with that, uh, if you have any questions uh, after you leave the webinar, um, you can either contact me, Julie, or uh, talk with with Ken uh, Bollinger, uh, he's uh, the director of the uh, Division of Food and Lodging with the North Dakota St Department of Health. He can provide some answers as well. So with that, um, I'm pretty much, uh, I think, wrapped up with, with my presentation. And so if there's any other questions I can answer, um, feel free to chat if you, if you have some. So there's a question here about, um, it looks like they, uh, they seal the jars by putting them in the dishwasher. Uh, can I tell them that this is a terrible practice? And, and uh, this is a good question because I've, I've actually had this question myself. Um, and the answer is no. They should not use a dishwasher to seal jars or to can products. Uh, I think that there's not enough um, control in that type of situation. Um, there's no guarantee that the product is going to be subjected to a certain condition long enough. Um, and there really hasn't been a, a lot of studies to prove that that's been safe anyway. So the boiling water bath is, is a better way to actually allow for the jars to be uh, processed and then as they naturally cool down, they will seal themselves.
So any other question? So again, I see that we're we're coming up to our our hour here shortly. Um, again, I want to thank you for uh, listening to the presentation. Don't forget next week, next Wednesday, Julie will, I believe, be back on to to uh, follow up with some more uh, information. So at this time, I I uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to Scott if he has any. Comments or yeah, you thanks, want to not really. Just uh, want to tell you, uh, thanks a lot for doing the presentation. Great job. And um, down the chat area, I did throw a few links in there. First uh, link, if you scroll up a little bit, was the choose your crop link that Cliff was talking about, and then the uh, food nutrition page um, is also on there. Then I've thrown the the survey up a few times. So I'll do it one more time, real quick. That's the survey link that Julie gave me. So other than that, I think we're good. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, and yep. have uh, a good rest of your day.